Good morning. We welcome you this morning on behalf of St. Paul's Lutheran Church here at 445 Elmwood Avenue in Providence. It's a beautiful day as we celebrate this Pentecost Sunday and we welcome the coming of the Holy Spirit. Come join us now as we worship and praise our Savior. Herzlich Willkommen. Gisia Lause, Hundo Oche Malkan. Maligayang Pagdating. Welcome, y'all. Come on in. Kasir Pai, you are welcome. Good morning. Please join me in singing Holy Spirit, Truth Divine, hymn number 257.
confession. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Eternal God, we confess that we have tried to hide from you, or we have done wrong. We have lived for ourselves, we have refused to bear the troubles of others, and have turned from our neighbors. We have ignored the pain of the world, and passed by the hungry, the poor, and the oppressed. O God, in your mercy forgive our sin, and free us from selfishness, that we may choose your will, and obey your commandments. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Almighty God in His mercy has given His only Son to die for you, and for His sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of the Word, I therefore forgive you your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to His people on earth. Let us read Psalm 25, verses 1 through 15, responsibly. I will read first, then you will follow in reading the verses in bold. Psalm 25, verses 1 through 15. In you, Lord my God, I put my trust. I trust in you. Do not let me be put to shame, nor let my enemies triumph over me. No one who hopes in you will ever be put to shame, but shame will come on those who are treacherous without cause. Show me your ways, Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me, for you are God my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. Remember, Lord, your mercy and law for they are from of old. Do not remember the sins of my youth and my rebellious ways. According to your love, remember me, for you, Lord, are good. 
Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore he instructs sinners in his ways. He guides the humble in what is right and teaches them his ways. All the ways of the Lord are loving and faithful toward those who keep the demands of his covenant. For the sake of your name, Lord, forgive my iniquity, though it is great. Who then are those who fear the Lord? He instructs them in the ways they should choose. They will spend their days in prosperity, and their descendants will inherit the land. The Lord confides in those who fear him. He makes his covenant known to them. My eyes are ever on the Lord, for only he will release my feet from the snare. Thus end the responsive reading. The first lesson is taken from the book of Numbers, chapter 11, verses 24 through 30. So Moses went out and told the people what the Lord had said. He brought together 70 of the elders and had them stand around the tent. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke with him. And he took of the spirit that was on him and put the spirit on the 70 elders. And the spirit rested on them. They prophesied, but they did not do it so again. However, Two men whose name were Eldad and Medad had remained in the camp. They were listed among the elders, but did not go out to the tent. Yet the Spirit also rested on them, and they prophesied in the, in the camp. A young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. Joshua, son of Nun, who had been Moses' aide since youth, spoke up and said, Moses, my Lord, stop him. Well, Moses replied, Are you jealous for my sake? I, will, I wish that all the Lord's people were prophets, that the Lord would put his spirit on them. Then Moses and the elders of Israel returned to the camp. Here ends the first lesson. The second le lesson is taken from the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 1 through 21. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. They heard this sound, a crowd came together in the bewilderment, because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in their own native language? Corinthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our tongues, amazed and perplexed. They asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said they have too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last day, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. 
Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heaven above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood, before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Here ends the second lesson. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Jesus meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him 
were later to receive. Up to that time the Spirit had not yet been given, since Jesus had not yet been glorified. The Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, on this day of Pentecost, as I repeat one more time, we talk about the work and the role of the Holy Spirit. What does the Holy Spirit do? How does the Holy Spirit affect us in our lives? What does the Holy Spirit have to do with our faith? All of these things come to mind as we talk about the coming of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost. And I would like to read one more time a portion from the scriptures, however, to address that. I would like to turn to the 14th chapter of John. You can do the same at home. And I would like you to pay attention to verse 26 of the 14th chapter. For here Jesus clarifies exactly what he said earlier about the giving and the coming of the Holy Spirit. In verse 26 Jesus says, But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. As the Lord Jesus said to the disciples, the Spirit will bring to mind, will bring back to remembrance all of the things that He taught them. And for me and for you that is important. It is important because when the Apostles were writing the Bible, when the Apostles were writing down their ideas of what they thought about Jesus and what had occurred in the life of Jesus, they were being moved by the power of the Holy Spirit in such a way that they were guided in their words, guided in everything that they said, guided in their ideas, guided in their phrases, to the degree that we can absolutely say that we have a flawless account of the history of salvation when we are reading the Bible. And to me, that tells me that the Holy Spirit guided the disciples in such a way that we don't have to worry about inaccuracies. And we don't have to worry about things that might have been left out that were important. It is all there. Everything that needs to be said and done is recorded in the Word of God, guided by the Holy Spirit. What is the work and the role of the Holy Spirit? It has a lot to do with the Scriptures, of course, and the preaching of the Scriptures, the teaching of the Scriptures, and all that it has to do whenever we proclaim God's Word. For when we read the Scriptures, we are reading God's Word. As I said earlier, a, a flawless account of the history of salvation. All the words of the Bible are inspired by the Holy Spirit. The writers wrote as the Spirit of God moved them. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, it says in the, in the Testament. And we read further that the Holy Spirit did move these men in such a way that it guided them. And it was dependable. And it was trustworthy. And that's important because it tells me that I have everything I need to know about salvation. It tells me that when I read from the Gospel of John and I'm reading the voice of Jesus, I am hearing God speak to me through the voice of Jesus, who was God, of course, as well as true man, Jesus of Nazareth. It's God's voice that we're hearing. It's God's voice that we hear when it's being preached and taught. It's God's voice whenever we surround ourselves with the Word of God and the Scriptures. And yet, we so easily ignore the, the Scriptures. It, it's difficult. It's difficult to find time to pick up this Bible at home and to, uh, let's say, I'm going to read for a portion of the day today. It's almost as if it's a task. And in reality, it is not a task. It should never be considered a task. When we have the opportunity to sit down at God's Word, there will be nothing ever more important than hearing about God's grace. There will be nothing, in my mind, more important than to hear God the Father bring His grace in Jesus Christ, telling me that I am forgiven for the things that I have done wrong. 
There is nothing more important to me than to hear the voice of Jesus Christ saying that I will have another chance tomorrow and the next day. And whenever, whenever I turn to the cross and realize that all of the sins of the world are left at the foot of the cross, that clears me. That clears me from the things I've done in the past, the things I've failed to do in the past, the things that I do in the present and will do in the future that will offend God. And I will, because I'm a human being. Many times I've offended God. And many times I've turned to the Lord God in prayer and asked for forgiveness. And I know that I received that thanks to the power of the Holy Spirit and the reading of God's Word. When you get right down to it, reading God's Word, it's, it's a commandment. It's the third commandment where we read, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Martin Luther defined that by saying, we should fear and love God that we might not despise preaching in His Word, but hold it sacred and gladly hear and learn it. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. That, that reminds me of the fact that God is with me as I take the responsibility to open up the Scriptures and to listen to Him speak to me. I don't think of it as an obligation, and I don't think of it as a heavy burden. I think of it as God's guidance as He provided all of the commandments and all of the laws to protect us, to make life better for us, to make life better for all those with whom we come into contact. Just as it is our responsibility now to adhere to the laws of the land and to try to perhaps cover our face when in public, and to, to keep six feet away from other people. These are the things that God declares in the fourth commandment, saying they're supposed to honor our father and mother and all of our authorities. That's all we're doing is trying to do what God tells us to do for the sake of our own health and our lives and the sake of others that are around us. Thou shalt remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. It's not a commandment. It's not a, a burden I have to carry on my shoulders. It, it, it is a joy. It's an opportunity. And it's a privilege to take, let's say, 10 minutes, maybe after breakfast. How about 15 minutes in the afternoon? Whatever, whatever your schedule opens up for, whatever you have the opportunity to do, take the time to read a portion of the Scripture. Start with the Gospel of John. It's rich. It's powerful. It's so, so deep in theology that it is said that you can drown in the theology of John. And yet at the same time, it is said that a five-year-old can understand clearly what is said in the Gospel of John. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. How profound that is! And yet how clear it is and how simple it is, even for a child to understand. That's what I'm saying about God's Word. As we read God's Word, it's not a burden, or we are filled with a lot of days that are just plain stressful right now. I don't like what I see when I drive around. I don't like to see lines of people. And I don't want to get in a line and have to stand in line with people. It drives me up a wall. And therefore, it's really a wonderful opportunity to go back home and, for instance, pick up the Bible and read the 23rd Psalm. And in the midst of all of this confusion, you're going to hear that God and Jesus Christ is your shepherd. And He will lead you to a, a quiet place, to green pastures and still waters. And there, your mind starts to settle down from everything that's got you upset during the day because you're thinking, about how Jesus Christ will guide you and take care of you. That's a blessing, folks. That's not a burden. That is a privilege and an honor that God gives to us. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. We should fear and love God that we might not despise preaching in His Word, but hold it sacred and gladly hear and learn it. When we gladly hear the Word of God and when we gladly learn what God is teaching us, we are keeping the Third Commandment perfectly. And God will bless us for that.
It's difficult. It's always difficult. But I remind you again, as you, as you sit at the feet of the apostles and the prophets, and you follow the history of salvation, and you see the promised Messiah come into the world, as you read about the birth of Jesus to the Virgin Mary, and you read how, how he, he continued in his life helping people and reached out in every possible way, and then even stretching his arms out on a cross on, on Good Friday, at 9 o'clock in the morning until 3 o'clock in the afternoon, we see our Savior, his arms stretched out, nails in the hands, a crown of thorns in his head. And we see that in the scriptures as it is fulfilled, as God promised the Messiah would live and die for us and fulfill what God the Father expected of us because we cannot. It's, it's St. Paul written all over. The good that I want to do, I do not do. But the one thing that I do not want to do, the evil, is the first thing that I choose to do. And that's why Jesus came into the world. To help us. And to live the life that God the Father intended. And that's what he did. And that's what we read. And then we see that he was raised on the third day. And, and the Holy Spirit was sent into the world on this day. Fifty days. 50 days, 40 days after the death of Jesus, Jesus was raised into the heavens and 10 more days later, the Holy Spirit, his gift was sent into the world and the apostles and the prophets, a fire lit upon their head and they were able to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ to such a degree that the people were moved and they believed and they understood and they, they, they to this day are moved. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. That's the work and the role of the Spirit. And that's why I encourage you to read the Scriptures, for in them you will read that as you are baptized, the Holy Spirit calls you into this community called the Church, with a capital C. And as we're in that Church, we receive the forgiveness of sins. And then it goes on to say in the Scriptures that if you participate in the sacrament of the altar, which I hope we do soon again together as a community, when you participate in the sacrament of the altar, the Holy Spirit comes into your heart and causes your faith to grow and be strengthened so that you grow and you glow in the light of Jesus Christ as you shine in this world and your works show the work of God the Father. That's the work and the role of the Holy Spirit. But then one more thing. In the scriptures it says that after through the means of grace, through baptism and the sacrament of the altar, then through the power of God's word, the God Holy Spirit comes to us and strengthens us and preserves us and keeps us as he has called us into that church. He now holds us tightly and keeps us in the one true faith of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, in which we know that Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ died and was raised for me and for you as our personal Savior. That's the work and the role of the Holy Spirit to keep us in that faith, now in this world and forever into the heavenly world that Jesus Christ will bring us into on the last and final day, his heaven as it is called. May God bless you in your faith. May you find time to read the scriptures May you be positive each and every day as God the Holy Spirit works within you to cause you to love the Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name, Amen. Now may the peace of God that passeth all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Depart in God's peace. Amen. And now invite you to confess your faith along with me in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
We continue with our prayers for the church, and on this day I have a special prayer for the family of Elizabeth Barclay. Elizabeth Barclay was brought into her heavenly home last Sunday, later in the afternoon of Sunday. And it's a sad moment as we all knew very well Elizabeth. She spent many years here at the church, and we now mourn the loss of Elizabeth, but we rejoice in her faith along with her family. So we bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks this day for the power of the Holy Spirit on this day of Pentecost, that we might truly, truly believe that when we come to you in prayer, you hear our prayers, and Jesus Christ, who is our High Priest in Heaven, brings those prayers before you in such a way that you answer our prayers in your good and proper time. Be with us now, Heavenly Father, and I especially ask a special prayer this day for the Barclay family as they mourn the loss of Elizabeth, and we think of her faith, and we keep in mind the open tomb and the resurrection. And we know, Heavenly Father, that in her faith she rejoiced in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and therefore she is with our Lord Jesus now, even as we pray. So, Heavenly Father, bless the family, bless all those that mourn the loss of Elizabeth, and keep us ever close in our faith to Jesus Christ our Lord. Bless again, Heavenly Father, as we ask each and every Sunday the members of the armed services that they might be kept safe and sound and out of harm's way. Strengthen them in their faith that they might enjoy their lives and also enjoy the moment in which they will come home safely to be with their loved ones. Be with us, Heavenly Father, as we now move into another month and we wonder when will this virus ever be removed from us. Bless us, Heavenly Father, that it might be taken away soon so that we might return to our church as a family and return to the love that you provide us in Jesus Christ. Be with us now, Heavenly Father. Be with all of those who mourn the loss of loved ones due to the virus. Be with all those who come to you in special prayers, asking their needs. And Heavenly Father, for our congregation, we ask that special prayer that you protect each and every one and keep them ever by the power of the Holy Spirit in the faith of Jesus Christ, now and forever, in the love of our Lord Jesus. In his name we pray this. Amen.
Con vis servilor.